Sergei Lavrov, always serious and concentrated in negotiations. What's your patronymic? I said Viktorovich. Well, goodbye then, he said. <laughs> Vladimir Patanin and Alicia Usmanov, men we all know. Yeah. Hearts that love once never forget. Not a word about Forbes lists, just old photos from his personal archives, many body tales and huge charisma. This is the very place where Brezhnev chucked cabbage heads around. Vladimir Medinsky. At school, they said I was a good writer. Culture Minister and Task Director General Sergei Mikhailov's fellow student. All lies. And prominent diplomatic officials, performing artists, television presenters, business people, foreign minister of a European country, two presidential terms. Since then, I've tried not to break rules or laws. This film isn't about politics, although the institute we'll talk about has had a great impact on the world's political map and is recognized far beyond Russia. A diplomat's work equals the activity of a military division, maybe more. While working on this film, we didn't imagine we'd be able to interview all these distinguished alumni and get access to their personal archives. We've traveled halfway around the world, from Indonesia to New York, and the word MGMO has opened every door, and sometimes even the hearts of diverse people all around the globe. The Boeing 767-200 from Moscow is landing now, with my boy on board. The capital's a lot different from a small provincial town, where the pace of life is much slower. You get up in the morning, you walk around, the wind blows, and you just enjoy the view. People in Moscow hustle and bustle. It's a business city. Everyone's in a hurry. Everyone's ambitious. There are dreams that can be goals. For instance, entering MGMO. Dmitry Polsky, a high school student in Chukotka, took part in the clever and talented TV program and as one of the winners was enrolled at MGMO. I'm studying at MGMO. And now I'm ready, ready to work to make my dreams come true and, well, to change the world. MGMO is the only university in Russia you can enter without entrance exams. Even straight-A students don't enjoy such privileges. We watched them during the academic year on the clever and talented TV show. You can already see what they're capable of. Many of them become very successful in life. Yuri Vyazemsky has been on TV for 27 years. The one and only host of The Clever and Talented has always said, Ngimo is a close family of students and professors. It's what makes it different from other universities. It's a leading university. Diplomatic and other high-ranking officials' children study there, as well as less advantaged students from single-parent families. But I'm 100% sure MGMO is a family. MGMO graduate Marina Kim hosts a political talk show on Channel One. She's watched the legendary program since she was a child, but only got to meet Vyazimsky in person during the filming of this documentary. My studio and green room are right next to yours, but we've never met. I've loved your program since I was a kid. Every year, around 140 high school students are selected for the program, candidates to enter MGMO without needing to pass state and entrance exams. Anatoly Torkunov only adds 12 of them to the admissions list. Here's the important thing. A social elevator going up should not be an academic elevator going down. It happens sometimes with state exams. And here is the most important and happiest moment, declaring the winners. Dmitry Polsky, dear friends, my warmest congratulations to you. We look forward to seeing you at our university on September the 1st. When I was at MGMO, I found myself thinking that the clever and the talented were really among us. High school student Sergei Lavrov graduated with honors. A diplomatic career hadn't occurred to him. He decided to apply for the Moscow Engineering and Physics Institute, but did follow his mother's advice to try another university. God bless my mum. She told me, for heaven's sake, 
If you want to enter MIFI, fine. But MIFI entrance exams will be on August the 1st, while MGMOs are on July the 1st. Why don't you just go for it? I took two exams, on July the 1st and July the 3rd. When I went to school, my classmates were preparing documents for admission to universities, where exams would have started on August the 1st. And by then, I was free as a bird. A new academic career would start in two months. Future Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov spent July digging the foundations for the new Ostankina Broadcast Center. Now Lavrov jokes that in Soviet times he dug the hole for Russian TV. <laughs> Well, my good friend Anatoly Tarkunov was there with me in the foundations. We had our first students' party there, even though we weren't even freshmen. We'd all been assigned to a student construction brigade, which, well, I think that was about three weeks. We filmed a movie about Fantomas. One of our future fellow students had one of the first motion picture cameras. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. The future president of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jamar Takayev, made up his mind when he was in 10th grade. He'd apply only to MGMO. He wrote a letter to the rector asking for information on the admission procedure. I was really surprised because I hadn't thought they'd actually write back. Anyway, I received a response. They approved my documents. I took my first exam on July the 4th, the last one on July the 11th. And a day later, I was on my way to the Moscow region with a student labor union to work in a potato field. Alisha Asmanov is one of Russia's richest businessmen. Not many know that his career also started in a potato field. On the first day of work in the fields, Usmanov and teammate Sergei Yastrzemski took the lead. The next morning they felt stiff, every muscle ached as if they'd been beaten with a stick the previous day. That was when Usmanov had the inspiration for his first business scheme. I went over there so I could have a look. And I could see a weighing machine. I did the maths. And that was when I figured out a way to increase the number of potatoes that we were able to move. And I did it by optimizing the vehicles that we were using for the purpose of transporting them. Three days later, our performance rates had increased so much that they sent me back to Moscow, because we'd already fulfilled the monthly quota. The irony is that nobody had any use for those heroic labor deeds. The country's food program was only important for collective farm authorities on paper. Future TASS News Agency's Director General Sergei Mikhailov came to learn this, but not from the news. No collective farm took the potatoes that we had harvested. I don't know why. So we sold them ourselves. Take these potatoes. We're not paying you, they said. Sergei Starchak, Russian Deputy Finance Minister, has a reputation for chipping away at Russia's investments in US dollars. Like his fellow students, he began figuring out economic realities in a potato field. There was a joke. They pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. <laughs> In 2019, Vladimir Patanin was ranked Russia's sixth richest businessman. Before becoming a successful entrepreneur and deputy chairman of the MGMO Board of Trustees, Patanin and his fellow students did farm work and walked about in the mud in their wellies. Once while harvesting cabbages, the students were playing basketball with cabbage heads and got caught by an inspector. Andrei Brezhnev, grandson of the General Secretary of the Soviet Union, opted to take the fall for this mischief. He asked him, what's your surname? Brezhnev, he replied. How dare you mock a true Soviet Communist Party member? You're in for it, said the inspector. Our monitor approached him and whispered that it was really Brezhnev. The very same Brezhnev. No joke. We all enjoyed the sight of him dashing for his car and reversing like hell out of that vegetable warehouse. Everyone was grateful for Brezhnev, for that protection. By the way, this is the very place where Brezhnev chucked cabbage heads about. Our job was to unload while the girls chopped for pickling down there. 
Despite their long-held assumption that MGMO is exclusively for silver spoon types, many of this elite institution's students lived in an ordinary dorm on Nova Cheryomushkinskaya Street. Fatah Shadiev graduated in 1976 and is now one of the richest entrepreneurs from the former Soviet Union. His assets are spread from Uzbekistan to Zambia and South Africa. Usmanov and Shodiev shared a room in the dorm. Sometimes they didn't even have money for lunch. We all contributed. I mean, well, our parents gave us money, and we controlled the budget, often rather thoughtlessly. Sometimes we had to live on bread, condensed milk and tea. That was fun. The Vietnamese students used to cook mostly potatoes, fried chicken and vegetables. The only thing we didn't allow was fried herring. It was their favorite dish, but we didn't share their passion. The dorm was in disrepair during the first year. The next year, the rector financed renovations. It was kind of a half-apartment type of dorm. There were two rooms and a small kitchen. We had to share the kitchen, stove and bathroom. We used to have meals together in that tiny kitchen. 1997 was a very hard time. None of us had any money. Our parents used to send us potatoes, canned meat and carrots by train. Sergei Yastrzemski graduated from MGMO in 1976. Just like any student, he was always broke. He needed a side job, which he took on with his course mate Alicia Usmanov. They'd go all over the country giving lectures and once even addressed staff at a mental institution. We got paid 12 and a half rubles for each lecture. Our scholarship was about 30 to 50 rubles. I gave 20 to 25 lectures per trip, so you can see I made decent money. When I gave briefings in the Kremlin during Boris Yeltsin's second term, journalists used to ask me, how do you feel so free answering such questions, which can be very hard sometimes? I told them, look, journalists pose no risk to me after those audiences I used to give lectures to. In September 2019, Minister of Foreign Affairs Sergei Lavrov came to congratulate MGMO rector Anatoly Tokunov, the professors and students on the beginning of the new academic year and the university's 75th anniversary. Greetings to you, Mr. Tokunov. Traditionally, the first day of a new academic year at Moscow State Institute of International Relations starts with its anthem. Sergei Lavrov wrote the song, which later became the MGMO anthem, in 1999 in the Altai, where he was kayaking. By that time, the institute already had one, but much had changed in half a century. Sergei Lavrov wrote a song of dedication to his fellow students. I must emphasize once again, of course, I wasn't planning to rival or replace the great anthem of the 50s. If I remember correctly, it was called An Old Building by the Moskva River, with my song. M. Gimor was based in another building then. I just wrote a dedication song for my fellow students. Shortly after that, they sent me a disc, on which they'd recorded this anthem, which had been performed by the Ministry of Internal Affairs Choir. To tell the truth, I was a bit shocked. Today, MGMO is one of the country's best universities. Outside Russia, an MGMO degree signifies a thorough education. Wherever you say MGMO from Uruguay to New Zealand, there's no need for an explanation. Everyone knows. The idea of establishing an Institute of Foreign Affairs came just before the end of World War II. In harsh conditions, the government, called the Council of People's Commissars back then, tasked the new institute to train top-class diplomats as soon as possible. A diplomat's work is equal to the activity of a military division, or even more. Senior USSR officials knew very well that the world would face fresh repartitioning after World War II. 
and that the Soviet Union would be faced with a whole new set of relationships to build with its allies. In 1944, Soviet troops forced the German army out of the USSR. The war continued in Europe, in Yugoslavia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Norway. At that time, a new diplomatic front was opened in Moscow. In October 1944, a new Institute of Foreign Affairs was established. The country's leaders were wise back then. They realized the country would be radically different after the war, that the Soviet bloc would expand. It was going to open up the world, so we'd need many new and well-educated specialists. And that's just what MGMO provided. Only 200 students were admitted to the inaugural class at MGMO. Five were heroes of the Soviet Union, who had received the highest state award for heroic deeds during the Great Patriotic War. These were the guys who entered straight from the battlefield. They were, and still are, good friends. Sadly, not many alive today. They called themselves the MGMO Nestlings. They even had their own 1948 alumni club. After the war, Nikolai Lebedev decided to get a degree. He came to Georgi Fransov, then MGMO's rector, and told him honestly that he didn't know any foreign languages and hadn't even graduated from high school. The war had prevented him finishing 10th grade. Lebedev needn't have worried. The institute accepted him without any qualifications apart from his bravery and sincerity. Lebedev went on to get straight A's for all his midterm exams and received the Stalin scholarship of 780 rubles per month. While preparing for the talented and clever, Dmitry Polsky bought piles of history and geography books and spent days and nights reading, believing he'd be among the winners. I was quite good at languages, the main things taught there, which a diplomat and MGMO student should know well. I learned three languages in four years. After four years, I graduated. MGMO has always emphasized language proficiency. As the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was in charge of the institute, MGMO professors invited eminent scientists and politicians to give lectures and seminars. Every year, around 120 foreign professors come here to teach. We're a kind of academic open-air stand. Since I've been rector, I can't even count how many heads of state and governments have given lectures here. Our girls had been talking to the president of Cyprus, who I approached, saying, how were our students? Did they speak Greek well? Aren't they Greeks, he replied. Can you imagine the language proficiency you'd need so that even a native speaker, the president of Cyprus, couldn't tell if you were Greek or Russian? Ludmila Vedenina, now professor of French at MGMO University, came here as a lecturer in 1961. After getting her PhD at Moscow State University, the first thing that amazed her in her new job was the number of foreign languages taught. We've got 53 foreign languages in our institute. It's a Guinness record. In addition to standard textbooks, our professors, especially the language specialists, created their own educational materials, which gave us a solid linguistic base. The same goes for the other sciences. We always had up-to-date materials straight from the hectograph. Vladimir Patanin well remembers spending hours in the language lab, brushing up on his French. A well-equipped language lab allowed for listening to various recordings and improving skills. And we already had educational films. It was all very high-end for the early 70s and the 1980s. When students were asked about their language preferences, Sergei Lavrov chose French and Arabic. There were 11 groups. Lavrov's name was on the list of the first group, which was to study English and French. On September the 1st, I arrived at the Institute and went to a lecture hall for the very first seminar for the first group. For roll call, when the professor said, Lavrov, two of us stood up. Who are you? he asked. I'm Sergei. I'm Sergei too. What's your patronymic? Viktorovich, I replied. Well, goodbye then, he said. 
Sergei Vladimirovich Lavrov was the only one officially in that group. It turned out that I wasn't in the first group, but in the 11th. And regardless of my preferences and dreams about French and Arabic, I had to study English and Singalese. The Emgimo campus is huge. I'm here in the center and this is the main entrance. Students usually meet here and people go out to take the air. The campus stretches 300 meters that way with the School of International Economic Relations and the School of International Business and Business Administration. And 300 meters that way to the Humanities Faculty, the School of International Relations, the School of International Journalism and six more. New schools appear regularly. There's a sports arena, pool, cafeteria and several hundred lecture halls. Today, the university encompasses 13 schools and institutes, branch campuses in Adinsova and Tashkent, an educational platform in Geneva, a pre-university training faculty, MGIMO's Gorchikov Lyceum, MGIMO's College and the School of Business and International Proficiency. The main campus has more than 400 lecture halls and over 6,000 students. Actually, 8,000 if you take the branch campuses into account. Studying's great, but let's not forget football. Future diplomats, business people and politicians would kick a ball about after lectures. Vasile Nibenzia was one of the best forwards. Today, he's Russia's permanent representative to the United Nations. Mr. Chairman, we point-blank reject U.S. policy on Venezuela. One hand holds Venezuela by the throat, introducing renewed sanctions that impede the country's development. The other hand picks the pockets of Venezuelans. We used to play together on the same faculty football team. He was very amusing on the field, I might add. He had a talent for that. Today, people see him on TV, but can you imagine? He was as thin as a stick back then and had long hair. We used to play at the Institute, and he really was pretty quick then. He thought it through well and tactically. I still play football. I played yesterday. But I don't run as well as I did. It's a unique feeling when you take a pass and go on the attack with some nifty dribbling skills, or when you make a great pass that leads to a goal. But now we're trying to stay in the center rather than veering to the left or to the right. Experience shows that such moves spell trouble, and not just in sport. Entering MGIMO has always been a challenge. There can be 20 applicants for just one spot. Even Vladimir Potanin, a straight-A student, had to prove his high school knowledge. MGIMO did an experiment. If you got straight A's, you had to pass two exams with excellent results. Without straight A's, you had to pass four. The exams were tough. It was a miracle. That year, the average number of candidates for one slot at the School of International Economic Relations was 1.5. It's extraordinary. That never happened either before or since. I got in and became an MGIMO student. Most of the candidates dropped out after the first exams. Rumor had it that only the chosen could get in, the children of the party elite and diplomatic dynasties. It's more like a competition for parents. Who's the most influential? My dad would have lost for sure. We had quotas. I recall a special enrollment quota for high school students, Afghans, Chernobyl survivors, and girls at our faculty. If you were an Afghan or Chernobyl survivor, it was easier to enter the institute. Ilham Alif, future president of Azerbaijan, entered MGIMO before he was even 16. The toughest part for him as a freshman was the diplomatic history exam. The professors were really strict. I remember I was once caught cheating in an exam. A bad example for students. But it happened. And that was a lesson for me. Of course, I was kicked out of the exam. Since then, I try not to break any rules or laws. At first, MGIMO was a male-only institute. Girls weren't allowed until 1946. There were an awful lot of us in that student body. And I very well remember that one of them was Svetlana Molotova. The new student's father was Vyacheslav Molotov, one of the top-ranked party leaders and foreign minister of the USSR at the time. 
We had different people in our year. Some probably from the elite whose parents were so-called Soviet upper crust. There were ministers' kids, Andrei Brezhnev for one. Everyone knows his grandfather, of course. Ludmila Larionova entered MGMO in 1954. Her parents weren't from the Communist Party elite. Her mother was a doctor, her father a military engineer. But it didn't stop her from working as an interpreter for the Soviet embassy in Thailand after graduating. You come there with your language skills and at first they say, please tell the street cleaner his work's bad. And then a prime minister arrives and you work with him. Ludmila Larionova's daughter was with her on that diplomatic trip. While her parents worked at the embassy, the little girl went to a nursery school in Bangkok. Today, Ludmila Vorobyova is the ambassador extraordinary and emissary of the Russian Federation in Indonesia, Kiribati, Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea. I grew up abroad. My parents were in the diplomatic corps. I always wanted to study at MGMO. And I graduated from MGMO. But as I've already said, I've never thought I'd work in the diplomatic sphere. I wanted to teach. After graduation, I taught La Shan at MGMO for four years, and I loved it, I have to say. There were no quotas for the Communist Party elite's children. All the other candidates had to pass the exams with the highest marks to have a chance of being among the chosen. Girls from workers and public servants' families had a tougher time. When we entered the institute, and for many years after, Girls had special quotas. It was against the constitution, but nevertheless they existed. They had different admission criteria to the men. Obviously, since the 90s, such quotas have ceased to exist. Today, we admit students to the university in accordance with their state exam results. Girls usually do better, so now there are more girls than boys. I have had the opportunity to make a comparison. I've been teaching here since 1991. That's 28 years already. The Institute's more democratic now. There were special quotas for candidates from Soviet republics. They had to pass an interview with party committees and the local Komsomol. I made a mistake and applied to the Institute via a national quota. I could just pass the exams and be admitted on a competitive basis. But I applied for a quota. That quota was for just three. Those who did worse than me in the exams were admitted. One was the Prime Minister's daughter. The other was the Communist Party Secretary's stepdaughter. The third was the Party Secretary's son. But he did great. He had 17 points. I had 18. And I still didn't get in for some reason. But girls with 13 and 14 points, well, they did. Usmanov went back home and focused on fencing. He gained the title of Master of Sports, made the Republican youth team, and soon after, the USSR national team. I spent that year well. I returned, got 18 points again, and was admitted. In 1946, the Institute started admitting non-residents, generally students from Soviet bloc ally countries. Today, foreign students make up almost a quarter of those studying at MGMO. Igor Keblushek graduated with honors. He's sure MGMO is in his DNA. Here are my parents. This is 1956, when they got married. That's my father. He's Slovak. You know what's amazing? He was one of the first Czechoslovakian students to graduate from MGMO in 1959. That's my mum a Russian, also an MGMO graduate. The future Czechoslovakian diplomat became famous all over the Soviet Union after the release of The Circus Princess. Director Svetlana Druzhinina spotted him in the Bolshoi Theatre bar and immediately offered him a role in the film. That Klublushek was a foreigner who wasn't studying acting but attended MGMO didn't bother her. He called his father, Czechoslovakia's ambassador in the USSR in the 60s, for advice. He told me about a well-known phrase. Not every actor can be a diplomat, but every diplomat has to be an actor. There's only one B on Klublushek's degree. He graduated with honors in Marxist philosophy. Yes, we had such a course. 
I got a B. I'm sure it wasn't because I'd acted in a movie that I didn't get an A. You had to study hard at MGIMO. The professors were pretty strict. Miroslav Lajcik graduated from the MGIMO International Law School and became the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Slovak Republic and was appointed the OSCE chairperson in office. Lajcik recently received the title of Honorary Doctor of MGIMO. MGIMO is the institute that formed my identity. MGIMO made me the person I am today. I've always said that, and I always will. It's a first-class institute. Cooperation continues. We now have 26 Slovakian students currently studying at MGIMO. Looking at MGIMO's huge campus, it's hard to imagine that originally it was a rather small institute with only two faculties. Then in the 50s, there were, as business people would say, mergers and acquisitions, with the Institute for Foreign Trade and Institute of Oriental Studies. It's when the journalism department appeared at MGIMO. After graduating in 1984, Alexander Lubimov had no thoughts of a career in TV. I got into journalism by chance. I just didn't want to go to Denmark to work for a trade mission. I knew I could bring a car, even a Zhiguli, a fur coat, or perhaps a cut glass chandelier back from an official trip. I could even put money by for an apartment, if I was pushy enough, or went on short rations. But none of that motivated me. Lubimov had been working as a conference interpreter since his second year. He spoke perfect Danish, Swedish and Norwegian. I'd already realized that I loved this free lifestyle. But in the Soviet Union, you needed to have an employment history. That was news to me. I had to find a full-time job. I had no regrets. I had something to do with journalism. I started working at the International Broadcasting Company in the radio broadcast department for Denmark. Three years later, Alexander Lubimov became a co-host of the most popular TV program in the 80s called Zgad, The View. Its target audience was young people, but every Friday night, millions of viewers tuned in for reports on the most acute social problems. Good evening, I'm Alexander Lyubimov. This is Vzgliad, and we're live, as always. This season, we're going to discuss what we think is a very important topic. Nikolai Lebedev graduated from MGIMO in 1950. 24 years later, he became its head. Most of the students of that period remember him as a strong-willed, even a hardline leader who didn't let people have an easy time. If I start doing something, I won't spare myself. I'll do it, no matter what. The first and main problem Lebedev faced as rector was a staff shortage. The institute had a big name, but didn't have enough professors. Cadres determine everything, and Nikolai Lebedev put this socialistic motto into practice. During the first three years of his leadership, Lebedev ensured the professors and doctors of science led the institute's departments. Professors would come to work at the institute on the sole condition that you provided them with an apartment. In the 1970s, it was very hard to find an apartment in Moscow. They were hard times. I had to deal with this problem through the Moscow Soviet of People's Deputies and the party's central committee. Natalia Virtuosova, vice governor of Moscow Oblast, failed the entrance exams twice. For my mum, it was beyond the pale. She told me, you'll end up being a market trader, that's your fate. It was the times when they brought those big checkered bags from China to Siberia. But there was a condition. Dad said I should apply to several universities. So I applied to Barnaul University, Moscow State University and MGIMO. MGIMO has always been famous for its democratic nature. Its students have always had opportunities to meet high-profile politicians and ask questions. I thank you that every year you find time in your busy schedule to meet students and nurture MGIMO's sense of fraternity. Such as when an ordinary student gets the chance to ask the foreign minister a question. We appreciate it. It means a lot. You mean an ordinary student can ask an ordinary foreign minister? That means even more, Mr. Lavrov. Thank you. 
Pardon me, Mr. Tolkienov made a show-offs in a good sense. We like being a bit special. We're always seeking something. MGMO is a free institute. Many students did internships with TASS, the Soviet Union's central news agency. There was no Google, no Yandex, nothing. TASS was the only information provider for the whole country. If someone needed to know how to spell this or that surname correctly, what this or that flag looked like, how to pronounce something properly, they called the TASS directory service, which helped everybody. The party central committee, media, embassies and so on. After graduating from MGMO, Yuri Kovaladze went to TASS. This was where foreign intelligence officers started keeping a close eye on the young specialist. One of his mentors offered him to undergo KGB training. I studied there for a year, graduating in 1972. From 1972 to 73, I studied at the Foreign Intelligence Academy and then became an intelligence officer. Balancing between two universities was impossible. It's impossible to study at MGMO and another university at the same time. We have strict rules. According to the university charter, 30 absences without a reasonable excuse should lead to expulsion. MGMO's authorities kept a strict watch over student morality. Kirsan Ilumjinov celebrated with a birthday party at the dorm's Lenin room. Foreign students came to wish him a happy birthday. The same day, one of the guests reported him to the authorities. The wheels of bureaucracy started spinning. They issued an order to expel me from the party for public intoxication and for setting an example of inappropriate behavior for the Komsomols and to exclude me from the institute for the same reason. Ilomzhinov was accused of immoral conduct and spying for foreign intelligence services because students from India and Afghanistan had been among the guests at that party. He decided to fight back. He wrote a letter to KGB chairman Chebrikov asking him to review his case. The KGB appointed a commission to see if I really worked for foreign intelligence. It was nonsense. I was a fifth-year student. I told them, say who I really work for. Babra Karmal, Mohammed Najibullah, or someone else. Thank God they exonerated me. As Alexander Lubimov says, course supervisors were in charge of personnel management. They watched the students and appraised them. By that time, Lubimov's father had already retired, but once KGB, forever KGB. So his son was an appropriate candidate for the National Security Service. They spoke to me a couple of times, but they were very vague conversations. I guessed I would never get into national security because my father had worked there. According to the official point of view, he had a bad name because of his involvement with the Oleg Gordievsky spy case. Subsequently, there was a trial. They sorted out candidates for the intelligence service very carefully. Their background and any possible links overseas were closely looked into. KGB's scrutiny of MGMO gave rise to a new myth among Soviet citizens. MGMO is training intelligence officers. It's obviously a myth. Although MGMO is clearly a tasty morsel for state intelligence because of its academic language training. I think that it's also common practice today. Honestly, I can see no contradiction between intelligence and journalism. After graduating, Dmitry Gradchev became a resident, but not in some embassy overseas. Today, Dmitry is a comedy club resident. I could never have become a spy, because then I'd have had to change my appearance. Anyone else could. Our education, well, it would be more than good enough to become a spy. In the late 1960s, the dead season was popular in the USSR. It was the first Soviet film about intelligence operations during the Cold War. Please listen to me, Father Mortimer. Listen, and you will realize that I'm not here out of self-interest but because of my concern for a neighbor's well-being and my desire to do good. The script was based on KGB materials. A famous spy, Conan Molody, was the prototype for the main character. He worked as a consultant on set under the alias Panfilov. Not many people know that Conan Molody was an MGMO graduate. The KGB invited Vyacheslav Trupnikov, future director of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, to a job interview right after his undergraduate practical training. 
I was buying a pig in a poke because no one told me what I'd be doing. They said that serving the state was a very serious job, that I would be an officer, well, something like that. And that is how I ended up working in the KGB's central office. Despite the stereotype, Mgimo was not a military barracks for training intelligence officers and party elites. Irina Bokova is a Bulgarian diplomat, UNESCO head for eight years. As most MGMO students, she was excused from attending some party courses. They really were great years. Marvelous times when we felt truly free. Miroslav Lajcik, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Slovak Republic, was Irina Bokova's fellow student. He shows us a unique picture. Soviet students celebrating Christmas in central Moscow. Foreigners were allowed to keep their traditions but within their dorms. By the way, pay attention to the portraits of Russian classical writers Nikrasov and Dostoevsky. As for traditions, here we're celebrating Christmas in our dorm. It was our first year. There were five of us Czechoslovakians. We gathered together and celebrated Christmas. We had a Christmas tree. Ideology was an integral part of education in the Soviet era, but it didn't hinder young students from demonstrating their artistic skills. Student parties became an MGMO tradition, as freshman Anatoly Tokonov and Sergei Lavrov wrote scripts for performances. Even after graduating, they could never resist going on stage to tell a good joke among former fellow students. I have to say that many others, who later became ambassadors, also took part in those student parties with Tarkunov and Lavrov. Some are still in their diplomatic postings. Lavrov was already a minister back then, he usually came to rehearsals. I could imagine just how hard it was for him to fit it into his schedule. It was impossible to imagine a student party without a performance. We used to write scripts in different places. I'd be in New York, someone else in Paris. We discussed the scripts by email, made changes and approved them. The plot was based on the Three Musketeers, but the text always concerned hot-button issues. Tarkunov played the headmaster of the Musketeers school. I played Cavalieri. That was my character's name. He was an intelligence officer. I don't remember who Lavrov was, but everyone acted well. The party was so much fun. We held the first such performance for our 15th graduation anniversary, then the 20th. These parties run like a golden thread through our lives. Later, KVN, the club of the merry and the witty, was restored to Soviet TV and MGMO students participated. Paraparam has become the university's most famous team. The best mental exercise is unconnected to studying. You just forget the academic part. The only thing that remains is humor. I relaxed doing it. I really wanted to be on KVN. MGMO graduate Dmitry Grachov was one of the non-elite youth team's most famous members. In my second year, I went to a rehearsal and they said, look, we need someone to play the role of the president. You look like him. More than any of us. That was when my life took a completely different turn. He took to the stage, uttered one line, and the whole room burst into laughter. Many people say that Avtovas will fold after Russia joins the WTO. I have to say that that's not the only advantage. Abramov and Grachov didn't become diplomats, politicians or businessmen. They went into stand-up comedy. From my parents' point of view, it's cool. Like, you know, my son is a businessman, a marketing expert. French, English, blah, blah, blah. And what use is it? Do I have to get up every morning, go to work, go back home thinking, I wish it were Friday, but I know that today I'm going to make people laugh. That makes me much happier. MGMO graduates are people who become successful in different fields, but all agree the university gives everyone the opportunity of a fundamental academic education and the ability to find, organize and analyze information. As a so-called influencer, I used to hang out in all the state departments and fish for something useful. 
During his US mission, Medinsky collected a small library of books on marketing and management. He asked his colleague Mikhailov to bring one of his suitcases to Moscow. I have a question for Mikhailov. When are you going to give me my books back? They've already become valuable antiques. The books are in a safe place. MGMO is on a par with the world's best universities and is often called the Russian Harvard. However, Rector Tokunov does not take this comparison as a compliment. I don't think we need to become another London School of Economics where 80% of students are foreign. As a national university, we have to train specialists for our own country. Have we trained enough specialists? Of course not. Quite significant means are needed to train national specialists. In 2007, three MGMO alumni established the Development Fund. Today, this is the oldest and largest endowment in Russia. Charitable donations are accumulated in its accounts. These monies can be invested in tuition and other things. Alicia, Batanin and I founded this endowment. Each of us invested five to seven million dollars. This is how the endowment's institution was established. We continue investing from time to time. President Kasim Jamar Takayev of Kazakhstan says frankly that the university predetermined his life. I don't think I would have had this career without MGMO. Especially if we talk about working as a UN Under Secretary General. So basically, when we say that MGMO is an international brand, we're not exaggerating. I entered the School of International Journalism. I've done this job all my life. I've never been untrue to myself and always dealt with information. I'm really grateful to MGMO because I love my job. How do I imagine myself in the future? It's a bit vague at the moment. But one of the images is as an employee of some energy giant. I can work in any sphere involved with international activities, international business, global economy, law. It's no exaggeration to say that MGMO fosters critical reasoning and the ability to find common ground with anyone during negotiations of any complexity. I got all of my knowledge and skills at MGMO, including languages, which have helped me in my presidency. Many think diplomats attend receptions, drink champagne, talk nicely and then go to play tennis or golf and deal with issues in between. Well, that's one side of our job. Nevertheless, the diplomatic service is extremely demanding. You have to have stamina and be diligent. It's not a nine-to-five job. The job requires your absolute dedication. Our diplomatic academic training is highly appreciated. Even by people who disapprove of it, ideologically or even politically. The most long-standing myth about NGMO is that the university is for the elite only. Few believe that ordinary people can study here, although over the course of 75 years, thousands of the university's graduates have been trying to wear this myth down. There's a stereotype in society that MGMO students are all silver spoon types, that they have no idea what real life is and so on and so forth. I can tell you from my personal experience and my friend's experience that MGMO ensures students get an excellent education. And you become the elite yourselves as you progress in your professional life. What's important is not a certificate lying around in an applicant's drawer, but the personal competencies that they display at work and in life. Their professional skills. The important ability to compromise so that national interests are safeguarded. MGMO graduates work all over the globe, but they try to stay in touch. Not because they belong to some powerful secret order which decides mankind's fate. MGMO alumni just know the true worth of friendship and cherish the years they spent here. Of course I feel nostalgic. And not just because back in the 1967 they sold beer in the fourth floor cafeteria. 
I really did. But because of those youthful memories, even childhood memories to some extent, concerning our student parties, meetings, and those lecture halls, you really felt at home there. They say that your first love will always be your first love. Well, I can say that the cozy, home-like atmosphere of that building, well, it lingers and stays warmly in your heart. People approach me at international meetings and say, I remember we studied together. Some say, you were our professor. I remember every one of my fellow students, but not everybody who I gave lectures to. These chance encounters bring me back to those times. It feels good. It's 30 years since we graduated, but we still stay in touch and meet. Not just here, but in many countries. I helped people deal with problems with an open heart. Those I hadn't seen for 20 years as much as I could. I think some solidarity exists. MGMO has many traditions, but the keys to success for this elite university's graduates are the same. A sound education, a creative atmosphere, and freedom of expression between students and professors. The old professors, they set up this tradition a long time ago, when the university was established. What is MGMO? Each graduate has their own answer. The best, beloved, close to the heart. Fun, love and profound knowledge. It's studying, it's friendship, it's amazing university days. It's my life, I've spent my whole life here. Close to my heart, beloved, unforgettable. Professionalism, responsibility and of course, fame. One of the world's leading universities. MGMO is Great! MGMO is awesome. MGMO is super. It makes you think for yourself. MGMO is great, close to my heart and beyond compare. The best, my love, the future belongs to it. MGMO graduates form the core of personnel in the Russian diplomatic service. When defending our country's foreign interests, they demonstrate the highest professional qualities, love for the nation and fidelity to duty. They represent Russia on the global stage with great dignity.